Okay. It's working. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I have Dr. Lucas Timms with me today, and we are going to talk uh, about uh, mistletoe extract therapy use in cancer treatment. And uh, I really wanted to make uh, this interview about mistletoe extract in uh, in cancer therapy because uh, two or three years ago, I, I wrote an article on my blog because I have hyperbaric center here in Poland, uh, and I'm writing about uh, alternative therapies. So I wrote this uh, article and we had uh, quite many phone calls and people were asking if you are treating uh, uh, with this method. And, uh, and then I realized that uh, there is such a big need for people to know that uh, when they get uh, cancer that they have many other options because for example, vitamin C, uh, it's been rec recognized already for a while and people are talking about this and uh, and mistletoe extract i think here in poland uh, it's really uh, nobody knows about it uh, so um so this is why I, I found you and I asked you to have this interview because there are not many people that can explain uh, this therapy uh, in such details. Uh, so uh, can you maybe at the beginning introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you are doing there in the United States and maybe uh, why, uh, what happened that you choose to make this mistletoe extract therapy uh, one of the main therapies you use because uh, I know know it's popular in Germany and in uh, in Switzerland but I guess it's not that popular in the United States so wh why you are using it what happened hmm? yeah, yeah. Uh, first of all just thanks for having me on Magdalena um, and I'm always excited to talk about mistletoe therapy and all the other things that uh, that we're doing sort of what you'd call outside the box uh, mm -hmm. cancer therapies. Um, my background is I am a naturopathic physician specializing in integrative oncology and I've been in practice for about 10 years. I uh, spent eight of my years at Cancer Treatment Centers of America um, kind of deeply involved in sort of all walks of oncology um, working directly alongside more conventional methods of treating cancer. Uh, so I'm, I'm well known to, to that side of things. Um, but my interest and my passion has always been working with uh, more integrative therapies, looking for ways to fill in the gaps, so to speak, and, and uh, offer more quality of life and healing support to patients both while they're going through conventional treatment, but also the ones that have decided to forego that or the ones that have at, don't have any other options left from that realm. As far as uh, how I came to mistletoe therapy, um, I had a pretty unique experience uh, about six or seven years ago, pretty early on in my, my um, career. I'd seen a patient with pancreatic cancer that came to our center and uh, had been diagnosed about six years prior with metastatic pancreatic cancer. And, and anybody out there that knows much about pancreatic cancer knows that uh, once it's metastasized, uh, living six years is not normal. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was curious, uh, you know, what, what this guy had been doing. He was in very good shape. Uh, he was working out every day. He had not suffered any weight loss, malnutrition, um, kind of the common issues we tend to see in pancreatic cancer. Uh, he had been taking some, some chemotherapy, but again, even with chemotherapy, the, the odds of living past two years are very, very slim, less than four, four or 5%. So got to talking with him. And uh, one of the first things he told me that he did was that Pretty soon after he got his diagnosis, he flew to Germany and uh, started a series of treatments there, one of which was mistletoe. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mistletoe was the only treatment that he had kept going kind of the whole time. And 
that kind of planted a seed for me again seeing this guy that was you know breaking all the all the rules with with a very deadly disease uh and so that kind of got me interested in looking at mistletoe i had i had heard i had heard about it prior to that but hadn't really done a deep dive into the research so that fueled me to kind of look more at it and i ended up traveling to to germany spending some time at some of the clinics over there and learning how to how to use this you know, this very old actual medicine um, mm -hmm. medicine that's been used for a long time and is actually approved in a lot of countries already has been for a while so that was kind of my my entry into mistletoe therapy and i've been using it uh, for the past five or six years since then and and i've seen a lot of good uh, results in my own uh with it mm -hmm. and and continue to be uh excited about its potential um both as a adjunctive treatment, but also uh, potentially as a, as a standalone treatment in some situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so you said that uh, it's being uh, used uh, um, a lot in Germany and in Switzerland. I've heard about that a lot. So this is true. Yeah, it's a very popular. Um, therapy okay uh, okay so maybe at the beginning for people who does who don't know at all what that therapy consists of can you maybe uh, tell a few words maybe about history because for me personally the history of it's uh, of mistletoe rudolf steiner it's quite interesting yeah. also because i have background in philosophy so i know i knew uh, steiner before uh, so maybe that and um, how you use it because it's a it's a speci special method of using it so maybe sure. just to, mm -hmm. yeah the, the history of mistletoe is pretty pretty neat um uh, there, there's a little bit of a um of a uh, religious uh, uh dynamic to it there's a little bit of a um i guess you could call it uh cosmic sort of uh dynamic to it um, I don't know how well that, that translates to some of your viewers, but it goes back to the early 1900s, uh, kind of the father of anthroposophical medicine, Rudolf Steiner, and also one of his colleagues, Ida Wegman. Uh, they kind of, um, it, it had been known that mistletoe had medicinal properties to it prior to them, but they're the ones that kind of first developed it in a medicinal uh, in, a, in a medicinal way and mainly with cancer patients. It was used for some other conditions as well, but mainly they were, um, they were using it and gathering and publishing uh, data on it in cancer patients. And um, so mistletoe, as you know, is, or as you may know, is a semi-parasitic plant. It grows on other trees and um, it Kind of, it kind of grows in the opposite manner to most of nature. It actually blooms in the winter and it has no root system. It basically feeds off of the uh, nutrition of the trees that it's growing on, uh, hence the parasitic nature of it, uh, kind of like a tumor. And if you look up at, at trees, you know, apple trees, oak trees, pine trees that have mistletoe in the winter, the trees are all, you know, kind of their leaves have fallen, but the mistletoe are there thriving like these huge tumors on the tree. And so, um, you know, that that's kind of an interesting uh, just from a, a, a nature standpoint, kind of how the plant itself uh, thrives and how it grows. Uh, but they found, you know, more on the scientific side that this plant is poisonous and a lot of our best medicines come from poisonous and toxic plants. And so the main compounds being the lectins and um, the viscotoxins, uh, the scientific name for mistletoe is viscum, viscum mm -hmm. album. Um, and so that's where the viscotoxin comes from. And in a lot of the research studies that you read, you'll see it referred to as viscum. Um, but they established a way of um, extracting these compounds from the mistletoe plant and found that they were good at inducing a, a Im immune response in patients, particularly cancer patients. 
and a, a way in which the immune system could help their own body fight cancer and restore uh, what a lot of the anthroposophical doctors call the, the rhythm of the body, the rhythm of the cells, the rhythm of the immune system. So um, that's kind of a little bit of the background. Uh, it's been very well researched since then, um, you know, and there's over 200 uh, scientific articles, published trials on mistletoe. It's probably the most well-studied um, biological agent in cancer patients. Um, so a lot of research to, to, to sift through, but more recently, um, there's been there's been a bigger push for, for research as we kind of have moved into a more research-driven um, phase of, of cancer care. And uh, we did have a, a recent trial open up at Johns Hopkins uh, University here in, uh, in Baltimore, a very prestigious uh, academic center. They do a lot, they publish a lot of research. So that's the first uh, phase one clinical trial that, that was approved, FDA approved in, this, in the United States. We're hoping that that will continue to uh, fuel the, the momentum with uh, kind of spreading awareness about the potential uses of mistletoe and it's uh, kind of figure out more about how it's best used as well. As far as how the medicine itself works, it's typically given by subcutaneous injection. It is typically given uh, two or three times a week, uh, typically given in the abdomen. There are other sites in which you can inject it, such as the, the buttock or the, the upper shoulder, but uh, typically it's in the abdomen. And um, what, we, what we look for to help us understand dosing and frequency and all that is that we'd like to see a, a skin reaction around the injection site. And so we, our goal is to try to achieve a certain size skin reaction, and that tells us that the patient is having an appropriate immune response, that those immune cells, those macrophages, those T cells are all being activated underneath the skin. And this, you know, translates to that immune response that we want to see where it's actually helping the patient's body fight the cancer from within. Mm -hmm. So... Uh... We are talking here mainly about cancers uh, because I know that it's been it's been used also in other uh, uh, other um, uh, illness. Uh, but uh, we are talking about cancer, so maybe can you tell if the if it has its application in all kinds of cancers? Maybe there are some cancers cancers that you find uh, it works more effective maybe the stages are also the difference in that we should uh, use it uh, at the early stages and then it's more effective um, and uh, yeah mainly that you can also mention the other diseases if you think uh, if it's worth mentioning I don't know probably use only it, uh, it, it with cancer yes yeah, I would. The one thing I would mention uh, for your listeners is that it is somewhat contraindicated to use it in patients who have autoimmune conditions, mm -hmm. um, because of the nature of an autoimmune disease. Uh, if you ramp up the immune system even more, it can worsen or exacerbate or flare those conditions, and so um, that's one of the things that we will screen for. Because, you know, it's not uncommon that cancer patients may also have an autoimmune condition. Um, but as far as, you know, your, your first questions there about, you know, the different stages, tumor types, all that, uh, there, it's, it, it potentially can be used in all tumor types. Uh, I think it's been, the, you know, well studied in, in, in some more than others, uh, such as breast, colon, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer would be probably the top four that we have data in. Um, but there's also a few, uh, not necessarily tumor types, but situations where we would also probably avoid it. Brain tumors tend to be a, a situation where there's a little bit of need for caution. Um, and also some of the bloodborne cancers like leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma. Uh, there are certain situations in those tumor types where we would um, where we would not want to use mistletoe. Um, some patients, it's rare, but some patients do have allergic reactions to the mistletoe. 
So that's another contraindication. We always do a test dose before we start ramping up their dose to make sure they don't have an allergic reaction. Um, but other than that, it is really applicable across all stages, across most tumor types. Uh, there are different types of, of, or different preparations, if you will, of mistletoe, depending on which uh, tree they're harvested from. Uh, there's uh, so-called uh, letters that correspond to the type of tree, like A, M, P. And so certain preparations of mistletoe have a, a more of an affinity towards certain tumor types and also certain um, stages or phases of the disease as well. And so that's kind of where the, um, the experience and the art of prescribing and overseeing mistletoe therapy is really needed to understand those nuances. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, maybe now you can explain a little bit its mechanism of action. I mean, you mentioned a little it's, uh, it's working through immune system stimulation, uh, but maybe there is something that uh, you can add. Uh, and also, what are the benefits for patients uh, that are using it other than... Uh, than um, because I, I know somebody who was using it and uh, he found it very effective in some... Um, uh, some things not directly connected to cancer, like yeah, yeah. We we, we do see a uh, a multitude of, of benefits with mistletoe, not just you know with hopefully a response, a tumor response, but also with a lot of quality of life measures in cancer patients. Things like cancer related pain, cancer related fatigue, uh, cancer related mood issues like anxiety and depression. Um, we see uh, patients with their, their vitality and their appetite return with mistletoe therapy. Uh, and I think that speaks more to the sort of the, what the anthroposophical doctors uh, refer to as sort of the restoration of the biorhythm of the body with, with the mistletoe. And so kind of from on a cellular level, what, what we're seeing is that, yes, there is a strong immune stimulation where you're ramping up the uh, both the production and the activity of dendritic cells, macrophages, T cells, natural killer cells, kind of the immune cells that are able to fight off not only um, cancer, but also uh, pathogens, viruses as well. We also see in, in cancer patients a lot of cancer patients will succumb to infections and they will succumb to uh, a suppressed immune system. And we do see, and it's, it's well published in the research that patients have far less um, uh, um, neutropenia related to their chemotherapy or related to their worsening condition. And so they're less susceptible to picking up those infections. Uh, which can also, you know, lower mortality rates and, and, and so on and so forth. So um, there, there's a lot of different ways in which mistletoe can benefit. Uh, we always are hoping for it to be, you know, mainly helping with the tumor response. But in late stage cancer patients or patients that are suffering with a lot of the side effects of conventional treatment, mm -hmm. sometimes the... Um, the benefit lies more in improving their quality of life or decreasing those side effects. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you mentioned before that uh, it can also be used as a standalone therapy. Uh, I was convinced that it's it's used more uh, with other treatments, uh, but um, in your experience, uh, in what, uh, do you have many patients that use only this uh, method and it's effective? And if yes, what kind of cancers are that? And, uh, mm -hmm. and well, that's uh, that's yet to really be completely fleshed out in the research. Uh, I, ha I have had some patients who have chosen to use, you know, sort of mistletoe alone as a treatment, uh, more late stage patients that are just wanting to focus on quality of life and doing anything they can to kind of slow down the progression. Uh, I think there's, I think we're going to eventually identify some, some areas where that makes sense. Uh, there was a, a well done study um, four or five years ago out of Serbia, 
um, that where they looked at late stage pancreatic cancer patients, and it was actually a you know a, a, a double blind study. They had patients that were getting standard of care and patients that were just doing mistletoe therapy, and uh, the mis the patients that were just doing mistletoe therapy actually uh, outlived and had better quality of life than the patients on the standard care. Now, albeit it was only a few months, but they, those patients did do better than patients just getting standard of care chemo. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and uh, I know that in your center you um, you use many alternative methods, and are there any specific kind uh, methods that you like to combine with mistletoe therapy and they work uh, synergistically together well, or there is no such a <laughs> uh, thing? Mm. Yeah, no, there, there definitely is. Um, so I don't think I mentioned it originally, but uh, right now I currently work at the Riordan Clinic um, here in um, Kansas City. Uh, and uh, the Riordan Clinic's been around for uh, a while, and their sort of, um, their, their claim to fame, so to speak, or a lot of what the clinic was built on was the research behind IV vitamin C with cancer mm -hmm. patients. And so Reardon Clinic has uh, published and established a lot of the safe protocols and, uh, for using IV vitamin C in patients. And so we do a lot of that here. And I do see that there is a, uh, a synergistic um, effect when patients are able to do both of those therapies. Mm -hmm. um, the IV vitamin C is, um, has more of a direct anti-cancer effect when you're infusing the vitamin C into the bloodstream. It's essentially acting like a chemotherapy, but without the collateral damage. And so you've got sort of that direct you know, strike going on with the IV vitamin C, whereas the mistletoe is working more indirectly by stimulating the body's immune system. So they're not working on the same front, which is why I think we get a lot of the uh, synergistic effects because anybody that's been working with cancer patients knows that the, the, um, you want to hit it from as many angles as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, are there any side effects other than this, uh, uh, this, uh, the, the one you mentioned that the, the area can be red and inflamed or uh, other than that, are there any side effects? Um, I wouldn't call them side effects, but uh, some of the side benefits actually is that we do like to see a little bit of a low grade fever. Mm -hmm. uh, we, some of you may know that a fever is actually a very healthy response by the immune system to foreign invaders, pathogens. Um, and so we usually see, well, anywhere from a one to upwards of two degree increase in patients on the day they do their injections. And we actually welcome that. Um, it's usually not that they're feeling, you know, the other flu-like symptoms you get with a fever, but they just, their body temperature, their core temperature, will rise and um, that's part of that immune response. Yes, okay. Um, because uh, it's said that um, very often people that has cancer, they didn't get fever for many years, so the, maybe it's a good reaction. And once we are talking about fever, um, I saw on your website also uh, uh, that you have infrared sauna. And uh, I'm a huge fan of that. And I was wondering if um, if you use it a lot with cancer patients and if the mechanism of action here is more like getting rid of toxins or maybe um, through stimulating this, this fever. I know that you don't get fever after that, but maybe the body somehow, uh, uh, somehow gets this reaction. Um, can you tell a few words about that? Sure. Yeah, uh, infrared saunas, uh, particularly near infrared saunas, are are very helpful. They can, like you said, help with the detoxification of uh, of things. So, you know, we're always looking for what's the underlying cause for people's cancers, and so some of them it is due to toxin buildups, and so obviously the detox support is much more important for them. Um, but another way in which saunas can or any sort of hyperthermia situation can uh, put pressure on cancer cells is by 
um, taking advantage of heat shock proteins. Mm -hmm. So heat shock proteins are pretty well uh, studied and uh, some cancer cells produce a lot of heat, you know, overexpress heat, sho heat shock proteins, but some of them don't. And the ones that don't are much more susceptible to uh, hyperthermia and, and being in, in, in higher temperature environments. And so our healthy cells are much better equipped overall to deal with that heat and uh, whereas it puts extra pressure on the cancer cells. Uh, okay, and um, there are um, um, uh, two kinds of this uh, mistletoe uh, extract medicines, from what I know. There is Iskador and there is Helixor, and uh, I, before I'm not uh, I'm not very much into this uh, subject, but before I thought that they are more or less the same, and uh, from what I know, they are not. Can you say what are the difference and um, yes, the main difference? Yeah, so those are probably the two most well known. Although there's um, there's a handful of other ones like Isorel and Fraxini. Um, depending on which country you go to. Helixer is very big in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, uh, Iskador. Um, uh, some of the other countries uh, use Iskador. You used to not be able to get Helixer in the United States. Iskador was used more. Uh, but now pretty much the only one we can get here uh, legally is the, uh, is the Helixor. Okay. So they're uh, different preparations, um, slightly different ways of uh, extracting and um, and kind of boiling down the, the compounds. Uh, they use slightly different um, trees uh, or preparations. Uh, and some of them are also uh, fermented. So they tend to cause more, um, more fevers mm -hmm. and a little bit more of a robust immune response. You have to be a little bit more careful with the fermented products like Iskador and like Fraxini. Uh, whereas Helixor is a non-fermented um, extract, and so it doesn't tend to cause as high of fevers, but is also generally more safe in cancer patients. Uh, okay, so uh, I think it, that's all questions I had, and uh, uh, I think it's a good introduction for anybody who wants to um, to get into that uh, treatments and for our viewers who are from Poland I only want to say that there are uh, there are here some doctors that use this method in their uh, therapy so you can just browse in web and uh, find it okay so thank you very much Dr. Lucas for spending this half an hour with us and uh, sharing all that uh, information it's my pleasure thanks for having me okay